This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is an organisation that works very hard to support animal studies scholars. ASA does a lot of important things such as organise the conference every two years and also puts out calls for papers, circulates information about funding opportunities, and just generally is there to support and bring an air of collegiality to animal studies scholars. So if you're not a member of ASA, think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, this episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series. You probably, regular listeners probably will have heard me talking about Animal Public's over the past few episodes. So, the Animal Public's book series is a specialty, specialty animal studies series within the University of Sydney Press. They do a lot of wonderful books that are very, very focused on animal issues. Many of their authors have been guests on this show. So, Trundle over to Animal Publics and have a look at their website, have a look at the books on offer and also if you're an Animal Studies Scholar, think about publishing with them. Okay, let's get down to business. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Sydney Town, a little bit windy but it is quite a spectacular day outside and we're in lovely Annandale which of course is the Knowing Animals podcasting home and I'm really lucky to be joined this week by Mira Atkinson. Now, Mira is very, very multi-talented. She's a writer. She's a musician. She's also a lecturer in English literature. She's worked in a number of different places, including Notre Dame, which is one of the universities which has got campuses all around Australia. But we've got a beautiful old campus in Sydney town. And today we're going to discuss her journal article, Alexis Wright's Literary Testimony of Intersecting Traumas. And that came out in the journal Animal Studies in 2018. And my sweet little cat, Tom Tom, has just appeared to say hello. He wants to get all the details about this article. Welcome to the podcast, Miro. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, So what led you to do this work? Um, Well, um, I think... The germ of it um, started a long time ago, really. I, I'm, I'm somebody who had a very sudden awakening um, of consciousness around um, non-human animals and our relationship with them in the way back in the 1980s. Um, it was just it was one of those things where I, I one day was just busy kind of being an average person in complete denial around. Um, the harm that we do and then I went and saw a film and you'll probably want to know what film that was, Gorillas in the Mist, and it just opened up some portal in my being that had previously been closed. I, I went home, I became a vegetarian, I signed up to Animal Liberation, I went down on the, the bus down to Victorian, um, you know, the duck shooting season protests and I just got into it straight away. It was a, a big shift, paradigm shift for me. Um, so I, I did sort of activism at the front lines for a while there and then at a certain point, um, you know, like so many people, I kind of went hard and then burned out a bit. And what happened then was I realised, look, everybody has different skills and everybody has different ways of making a contribution. There's not only one way. I'm a writer. I want to find out how I can contribute um in that sense to this movement and so I you know at that point I started to become interested in how I could do that it was a long time I guess before that led to writing in in a scholarly way and and a kind of article like the one that you that you've picked up on wonderful so the journal article we're discussing today is centred around two books, which is Carpenteria and Black Swan. I have to admit that I've not read either book and perhaps uh, 
Many listeners will not have read the books. Could you start by telling us what the books are about? Sure. Well, um, that's sure, I say, and then realise promptly that Alexis Wright is one of those writers who writes such uh, dense and complex and, um, and rich literature that it's it's really hard to sum up in a in a kind of nutshell because yeah there are plots but there's so much more happening than a kind of you know narrative arc um so carpenteria is is about um uh aboriginal communities in the in in kind of contemporary australia um you know dealing with the legacies of of colonialism and um in up in the gulf of carpenteria and uh then a multinational mining company moves in on on sacred land and it's about the sort of fallout and and um and consequences of that um and but it's about so much more than that it's just it's an amazing work um and uh the swan book is is also um e- perhaps even harder to summarize really it's um uh ostensibly about a young um aboriginal very traumatized aboriginal woman called oblivia who is um adopted by um a refugee from the um it's speculative fiction so adopted by rep- a refugee from the um climate change wars um that have wiped out the northern um hemisphere and um and then it's about how you know it's about stories it's about oh god it's just too hard there's such there's such immense works and um but but my interest in them in um, my monograph and in this article really is is centered o- around um looking at how they are operating as um literary trauma testimony and in this article uh, in particular it's about looking at how um human trauma and transmissions are impacting the environment and non-human animals so trauma is a very big theme in the general article Mm. can you say a little bit about trauma studies Uh, it might be an expression that's new to some listeners Mm -hmm. what is trauma studies Mm. well trauma 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 studies and trauma theory they're they're different and there's some overlap so trauma studies tends to relate a little bit more to the kind of uh, clinical trauma um, side of things um, and trauma theory tends to be a little bit more related to I guess the literary trauma studies or cultural trauma studies um, or trauma theory kind of um, camp they both really come out of um, Holocaust studies and uh, so an interest therefore in looking at um, how trauma works in kind of theoretical and conceptual um, ways um, and that's obviously going to really differ depending on what kind of discipline that's happening in in literature um, for those of us who are literary studies scholars like myself or literary slash interdisciplinary studies scholars and creative writers and creative writer scholars we're really interested in um you know how how trauma can be testified to in language and in literature specifically and the different forms of literature so can you tell us then what role are the non-human animals playing in the two novels that you look at well alexis wright is is quite remarkable in how she's working with animals um they're not i mean they take a very central place in both novels they're not it's really interesting because when um sophie cunningham was interviewing uh wright um at the wheeler center after the swan book was was published um there's a point in the interview where she's she's asking right about characters in the book and she's saying so tell me about the characters and she stops herself and qualifies that by the human characters because right actually does this thing where animals aren't just there as sort of ornamentation or sort of part of the human environment culture um 
they're there as characters. Like, they've got this incredible presence and, you know, they can't just be relegated to metaphor as, as literary studies have so often wanted to do um, when looking at how animals are operating in, in literary works. Um, you know, they really occupy a very meaningful place, especially in, in something like the Swan Book where... I mean, really both, but the Swan Book, I think, even more so because... Um, you know, there's this tragic entanglement between the between non-human animals in general, the swans specifically, the black swans, and um, climate crisis. Yeah. So, climate, uh, I think, also clearly plays a role in your analysis, and you talk about um, climate change as a trauma for non-human animals. Can you say something about how you make that link or what your thinking is with regards to that issue? Well, in, in the kind of broader field of work that this article emerges from, which is my monograph, The Poetics of Transgenerational Trauma, um, I mean, I'd done my dissertation on along those lines and... Um, and that was before I expanded into this kind of territory looking at climate crisis and non-human animals and the kind of traumatic entanglements um, with them. Um, I went all through my PhD dissertation, um, you know, focusing my ex exploration around transgenerational trauma transmissions on, um, on familial trauma and on those looking at the kind of uh, cycles and feedback loops between individual familial trauma and cultural, historic with a capital H, trauma, collective trauma. Um, and then after I graduated my PhD and I came back to the, to the work to expand and develop it into a monograph, I realised how incredibly humanist literary trauma studies was. You know, there was just no mention of non-human animals. Um, and not that I knew of anyway, not that I had come across. Um, so that's why I wanted to really expand. I think I've forgotten your original question. <laughs> well, it was around um, what I think is quite an interesting way of thinking about um, climate change oh, and yes. what humans are doing to animals. Yes. Yes. So then when I started, so then I developed this new chapter um, called Provocations Beyond the Human. And, and I focused, I wanted to focus on Alexis Wright's work because I thought that was just very rich for looking at, at, um, at that kind of testimony. Um, so I guess one, you know, they're, they're, I, I approach them as separate sort of issues to, to look at but very much entwined that, um, that there are ways in which we, you know, we've sort of, the ways in which we have bound non-human animals into our kind of mm, traumatically structured <laughs> society and then the co part of the consequences of that are climate change. And so there's all kinds of... I mean, that's the most speculative chapter in the whole monograph. I go fairly out on a limb there and, um, you know, ask questions like, can we consider climate crisis as a kind of form of planetary PTSD. Um, it's all very interesting, completely unprovable, <laughs> but interesting, I think, to think upon. Well, there are certainly some thinkers out there who are starting to think of animals as, non-human animals as refugees mm. in the cr mm. climate context. Mm. So I think it, there, is, there is some of that thinking going mm. on. Mm. So intersectionality is mm. another big theme in the paper. Can you say something about what w that means to you? As you point out, it's a quite a perhaps contested or perhaps misunderstood concept and then what you're doing with it to help you understand the book and the role of animals? Yes, intersectionality, yeah. I mean, it is, you know, it is it is a bit, a bit of a buzzword at this point. So um, I guess I want to point out that, you know, my interest in it is that once I started to get into looking at how, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a quote or, or a kind of reference to a very well-known um, intersectionality scholar, Patricia Hill Collins, who talks about 
the naturalization of um, social socially constructed hierarchies. Right. So I think once you know, once I started to foray into that territory, which of course you know you're going to foray into as, as soon as you start to look at how trauma is operating as a social force, um, then intersectionality became really compelling because you know how else like in what other framework can one talk about those hierarch socially constructed hierarchies if you're thinking through how trauma is transmitting um, between communities and individuals um, socially it becomes a really useful framework so that's that's really why I employed it um, and I, I also think that you know part of what I have observed happening is we have all these distinct movements which is incredibly important you know we have this feminism over here we have um, you know animal advocacy over here we have um, you know uh, race activism over here we have all these movements and it's really important and specific that we do have um, specific movements but it's also really productive to sort of step back and think about how actually all those things relate to each other and if we start if we think about something like structural trauma without acknowledging that all those things relate to each other then we're getting a very small slice of the pie in terms of our ability to understand what's really happening and the big picture so um, I really wanted to dig into trying to understand how all these things are feeding into each other and how a writer like Alexis Wright reveals that in a literary way, testifies to that in a literary way. To me that's a remarkable feat. It's a, it's a, I mean they're hugely ambitious novels and I think only a hugely ambitious novel could or, or huge, not necessarily novel but only a hugely ambitious literary work can do that. Wonderful. Well, we've talked, you know, about uh, some of the, the theories you're using in the novels, etc. I guess the big question I really want to ask you is, what do you conclude or what, do you, what insights do you gain by this, you know, through this journal article, through this reading? Um, well, uh, it's not going to be a, a very earth-shattering conclusion. Um, and it's one that Alexis Wright talks about a lot, but you know, an affirmation that story stories matter, storytelling matters. Storytelling is how we make sense of the world that we've created and how we recreate the world. Um, you know, I think that's I think that's one of the big um, conclusions that I come to, but also that crucially that this kind of literature that there are certain kinds of writing certain kinds of literature that are themselves a for a social and political force um and that um i think it's important to acknowledge that i think you know that there's a difference between writing and literature that is entertaining or enjoyable and writing and literature that has that is witnessing, that is testifying um, to structural trauma and that therefore has um, some kind of capacity to advocate for change in, in a really meaningful way. And have you had the opportunity to discuss your thoughts with the author? Because um, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there any resistance to reading the books with the animal very much in focus or do you think that would be embraced or, you know, quite acceptable to the author? Um, well, it, it's interesting. I, I haven't – I mean, I've only had a little bit of email contact around um, around this work with um, Alexis Wright. I, we, we haven't talked about that question specifically. Um, but I think, I mean, she is on record in interviews as, as talking about how important animals are to her. Um, you know, her, her Wanyi culture um, and 
how you know how she has a definite interest in in engaging with animals in her work so um but i don't know about her personal politics beyond that or her you know whether she has any interest in advocacy she has a lot of people writing about her <laughs> um in scholarly ways and and she's a pretty global figure at this point so um but i don't i I don't expect that she would have any resistance to being read at that level. I, I would expect she would maybe welcome it in terms of understanding. You know, she's written a book like The Swan Book, which is, you know, very much and, you know, before it became quite as big in terms of, you know, the public dialogue, um, that book was really concerned with climate crisis. Mm. Wow, fascinating. Fascinating. Well, Mira, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? As ready as I'll ever be, I think. <laughs> now, these are very focused towards animal studies scholars and I, I, I guess I detect that you don't primarily identify as an animal studies scholar, although you're obviously very empathetic and have done some publishing in the field. So if we need to adjust the questions a little bit, that's fine. That happens from time to time. But let's get going. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I read a lot of stuff in the 80s that was very uh, heavy, controversial, fair, um, you know, like Hans Ruscha's Slaughter of the Innocent about the horrors and um, in his view, deceptions of the vivisection industry. So I did a lot of that kind of read. At the time, it seemed really academic to me, but I now know that wouldn't qualify as a scholarship as I think of it now probably Carol um, Adams sexual politics of meat would be the first mm, great can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote well I think my monograph was you know the first that that p particular chapter in my monograph was the first time I ventured into scholarship I had done some literary stuff you know essays and poetry etc but um along these lines but not not scholarly until that point. Great. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? That's kind of difficult because I'm, I mean, I do consider, I will, I will say that I do consider myself a, an animal, critical animal studies scholar at this point, but, but it, as a sort of, I guess, as an arm of my research, not my main focus but as an arm um it's certainly one i'm interested in in doing more of um well it's hard to pin pin down one person because i'm quite interdisciplinary so i'm really interested in connections and um and i'm also fairly new to critical animal studies research so there's a lot for me to discover i, I think one thing that did really have an impact on you know derrida's view that the violence we do to animals begins in language that had a real impact and um you know i'm very interested in what language can do to upend that and what literature particularly can do to intervene on that um but one experience i think you know had a big in impact on me and that was being a writer in residence in the life of the uh, in the anthropocene conference um, in 2013 at the University of Sydney and my role there was to sit in on presentations and come up with creative responses which I'd never done anything like, like that before so that alone was quite <laughs> interesting but it meant just sitting in sessions um, and it was a very interdisciplinary conference so it meant just sitting in sessions I may not have known anything about the person or the 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 work um, previously and and having some sort of creative response and um, so I encountered a lot of people from different disciplines and some of the stuff I absolutely loved and some of it left me a bit cold some of it was a bit like you know it didn't have a sort, any sort of grassroots blood in it um, I like a bit of core activism there in scholarship um, but I really found that very intriguing and um, and I was quite pleasantly surprised that a few of the <laughs> creative responses weren't even half bad. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I was one of the keynotes at that conference, yes, so you have to I send remember. me your creative response. <laughs> well, they did. <laughs> a selection of them did get published in Animal Studies Journal. Okay, yeah. but not that one, presumably, or did you perhaps you I didn't write one I don't think I saw them. yours. Oh, you didn't see me. No, I don't think okay. so. Phew. I can't remember. <laughs> I'll have to go back through my files. Maybe I did. 
What did you do it on? What was uh, it was on uh, politics and visibility and animal welfare law and okay, all the good stuff. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, perhaps you started answering this question, but perhaps you've got more to say. What's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I think the most important thing academics can do for animals is the same as anybody can do for animals, which is to adopt a whole whole food plant-based diet and boycott products that um, involve animal exploitation and suffering as much as possible. I think that's the first best step that anybody can take because our our consumer dollar has more power to advocate for social change than anything else. Um, but then after that, I think academics are in a really unique position to challenge dominant discourses um, that enable the continued exploitation um, and endemic suffering of animals. And, you know, people in different disciplines are obviously going to be able to do that in different ways. But I think that's possible in, you know, so many disciplines beyond what we think. We tend to think, oh, okay, maybe science and humanities. But, you know, what about engineering? What about architecture? Like there's scope everywhere. Mm, absolutely. Well, if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Um, well, that's a tough question because there's so much wrong with it that, and, and some great stuff right with it too, but so much wrong with it it's hard to know where to start. I think it's very evident that the change needs to happen on the human end of that relationship. Um, I guess, uh, in my view, if you boil it right down, um, a revolution in both economics and consciousness is required. And, and I think it is, you know, obviously it's happening, but, but it, it needs to happen on a really, really mass comprehensive scale. Um, you know, we need a, a collective majority shift from denial and ruthless self-serving to empathy and compassion and, and, and economics that enables that. And from there, you know, so much would just correct itself. Wow, that's a big it's a big ask, <laughs> but we'll we'll try for it. You're we'll I think you're it. right. <laughs> so what are you working on next? Um, well, on the scholarly front, I'm involved with setting up a new venture called the Public Feelings um, Research Network. Um, and uh, we'll be launching the network with a public event hopefully later this year and then following up with a special journal issue and I'm working on an article about trans species trauma testimony in contemporary Australian poetry for that. Goodness. Yes. Yeah. So which poets do you have your eyes I on? I have my eye on a recent guest of yours actually. Oh. Um, so I'll, I'm writing on David Brooks, uh, Christine Townend and uh, John Kinsella. Chris has also been on the podcast. Ah, yeah, good. John, I'll have to get John, rope John in somehow. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And um, so that's the main thing you want to kind of mention? Um, at the moment in, in this um, territory, that's my focus at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I've got, a, I've got bigger ideas for sort of down the track, but that will require a, a particular context to... To enable to it. realise mm. them. And so where can people find out more about your work? Uh, well, I have a, a writer website, um, www.miraatkinson.com, and that's sort of my main writing site. It's mostly showcasing previously published literary work, but it's got links to academia.com and my scholarly stuff there. So it's probably the, the best place to find me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about their work. And you can also find us online. You can follow us at Twitter at knowing underscore animals or at, you can follow me at so underscore s. We're also on Facebook at Knowing Animals and Instagram. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.